Hi, in this video, I'm going to show you how to perform a hacking event with cross-site scripting. So let me give you the details about what this application is going to look like. But before I do, I want to give you a warning that this is, of course, uh, a hacking exercise which should be done ethically. That means if you're one of my students, you're learning how to program correctly so that this does not happen to you. If you plant a keylogger on somebody's machine, you're violating laws and privacy. Don't do anything stupid, okay? So let's take a look at the example of what we're going to build. So you can see that I have two websites up here. I have one called victimsite.com, another one called hackersite.com, and in between you can see that there's just one line of text. So let's change this to a different extension, and I'll show you that it has an application on it. So I'm going to go to index.php, and it's posting a comment, it says. So this thing is supposed to do some post, like I say hello, and I'm going to say, how are you? And when I click the post, you can see we have two things at the bottom. We have new comments, and it posts just exactly what I put into the form, and then it shows you the information that the form received. So it posts to itself, and so the form and the new comments are both on the same page. We'll look at the source code in more depth in a minute. Over here on the hacker site, doesn't look like anything is going on yet, but there will be. So behind the scenes here, you can see that I have a VS Code set up, which shows me a key log program that is listening for um, a post from another website, and it's going to save that key to a file. So it's a keylogger. So let's see how this works. I'm going to go over to this side again and I'm going to type something. I'm going to say hi again and I'm going to say uh, hello and this time I'm going to paste in a bunch of code. Now look at this code here that I just created. You can see it starts with the word script. This is JavaScript code and uh, you can see that it's going to be posting a fetch command and it's going to hackersite.com. So it's the other website I have set up on my computer. And the goal is to simply save this keystroke to a text file. But how does it work? Uh, it doesn't automatically start working. So when I post this, uh, it, you can see that it's saying hi again and hello. And here is the array that was uh, received. But one small difference, you notice there's a space here. So what is going on in that space? It doesn't show up in the text, but if I go to the inspection and I look at the source code, okay, so what I'm going to inspect then is this section down here under the new comments area. Let's see what's inside of there. We've got ourselves a script and this code that I posted as a comment is now part of the web page and it is active can't see what's going on unless I know what JavaScript is up to, but let's type something else. So I'm going to type in, I am a victim and didn't know it. Now, as I type this, do you see any strange behavior going on here? No, none at all. It appears normal, but this JavaScript is intercepting those keystrokes. Now let's come back over to the hacker site. Doesn't look like anything went wrong. Check the source code and there is a new text file. It's called keylog.txt and you can see that I am collecting the uh, keystrokes from the other side so I'm going to type some more over here so you can see as I type in the form every keystroke is captured and saved in a remote server on a different domain and I have successfully done a cross-site scripting attack so if that's interesting to you and you want to know how to do it Let's take a look at how it works, and then we're going to code it together. So this will take a little while, but you'll be smarter when you're done. So let's start with a little background. So first of all, we're working with JavaScript. That's usually what you need when you do cross-site scripting. So now let's talk about how this is set up. So we have a website, and we have the hacker, and the hacker has to insert into a website a script. So in our case, it was just posting a comment to the screen. In many websites, it saves your comments into a database and then posts them later when users want to go search for those comments. So your code can lay around for as long as the database is active. So we plant the malicious code on the website. Now along comes our victim. 
and she says, get me a page of comments. So this person could be in another country, doesn't have to be even on the same computer or the same network, but they are both accessing the same website. And so the website responds and it says, sure, I'll show you all the comments that I have in my database. It says, number one, it says, nice pick. And two, I like your idea. And then of course, attached to that is the JavaScript. So now our victim is showing on the screen two comments. And then in the background, JavaScript is running. So she starts to type. And as she does, the keystrokes are not only sent to the website that she's looking at, but redirected and captured in a text file over on the hacker's computer. So that's the diagram of how this attack works. Now let's do a recipe of everything you're going to learn of how to build this. So first of all, I'm going to show you how to set up two web servers on your computer. So you can see I had hackersite.com and victim site. I'll show you how to configure that using a local website. Part two, I'm going to show you how to set up a really simple app that will take a form input and post it to itself. Number three, we'll create the listener app on the hacker website, which will listen for anybody that is sending JavaScript commands. And then we're going to contaminate the victim's blog and we're going to post in those comments with JavaScript. And then finally watch the keystrokes roll in as the victim is hacked. All right, let's go back to the first step here. So first of all, how did I create these web domains, victim site and hacker site? So I don't have access to a web server where I'm paying money, I'm just doing this locally. So the program I'm using to run my website is MAMP, which is for Macintosh, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. You might have WAMP or LAMP on your computer. These are packages that allow you to do web development without buying a server. And so for my students that I teach, uh, we recommend MAMP because MAMP runs on Macintosh and also has a version for Windows, which covers almost everybody. All right, so how do you make those two domains? Well, you need to go into your terminal and we're going to take a look at the Mac way to do things. So the command I need in Mac is trying to edit the hosts file. So it's in the slash etc hosts and we're using uh, Mac, so I have to type in sudo and nano. So sudo is for supervisor or super user, and we're going to do the command, and nano is the text editor. So let's see if I can get that open. So this is a secure file, and I need the admin password. So you can see that I've told it to interpret these two domains as a local host. So 127.0.0.1 is the same as localhost. And you can see by default, your computer will have localhost listed here. And so all you have to do is edit your file. And now these two URLs no longer are accessible to anybody on the internet. Your computer will interpret them as a local server. Okay, so I'm gonna exit this and save the changes. Now, for those of you that are using Windows computers, you can find the host file in the following directory. You go to C, Windows, System32, Drivers, etc., and then finally there's Hosts. Now, you have to open this as an admin account, so if you don't have admin access to your computer, you can't make this change. Simply edit, it, edit the file in Notepad or your favorite text editor, save the changes, and then those two updates will apply just like I showed you in the Mac. Now I want to test this out, so a command that we can use is ping. So ping will send out a message that says, are you alive website? And you can see that the reply comes back and it is coming back from this address, 127.0.0.1. So that's the local host. I'm going to ping the hacker site and hopefully get the same results. So I can see that there's a reply coming back from the local host address, which is 127.0.0.1. So now you got yourself set up for two domains on your local computer. All right, so now the next issue is where do I save my file? So you can see that I have some source code for a website and it's in a folder called htdocs hacker. So where do I put that and how do I make my web server look in that folder for its information? 
So to do the editing for this folder, you need to go into your MAMP directory. So if you haven't installed MAMP, go out to the website, download it for your computer, and run it. So in previous tutorials, I've used MAMP, and so if you're in my class, you've probably already got this application installed. If you haven't, go out and install it, and then come back. So what I'm looking for is my MAMP folder on my application. So in the Macintosh, you can see it's here. And inside of this uh, directory are all of the different components to the MAMP server. So by default, you will have a directory called htdocs, which stands for hypertext docs. And you'll have different things in there. Uh, you might have some default files, or you can see here that I've built some other applications. So htdocs is normally where you put your whole application, your script files, and any, any kind of images that you're going to publish with your website. But you can see that I've set up two other folders here. I have one called htdocs for victim and htdocs hacker. And the, these are just folders that I created. But I need to tell the web server where that these are located. By the way, if you're looking at a Windows server, you're going to be probably in the directory called c slash MAMP. That's normally where MAMP is installed. The next thing I need to do is open the configuration files. So let's go up to the conf folder. And you can see that there's quite a few things here. I'm looking for the folder called Apache and then extras. And I'm looking at this file here called httpd-vhosts.conf. So vhost stands for virtual hosts. And that allows your computer to have more than one domain that it serves. You can see that I have made a backup copy. There's a good reason for that. I just did a right click because I want to make sure that I have a backup in case I totally mess this up and my web server doesn't start. So I'm just keeping a backup copy for insurance. Now let's take a look and see what's in here. So I'm going to open this with, um, I don't know, some kind of a text editor. I'll use text edit. You can use something on your computer that might work better. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit and let's see what's going on. So the file that you open may have something a little bit different than mine. Uh, this tells us a couple of examples. I just left those alone. But here's what I added that was new. So I said, I want to set up a server that will find the uh, documents inside htdocs victim. And you can see that that's the pathway. So this is Macintosh looking. Your C drive slash MAMP will be on the Windows version of this. But you can see that it's the folder that I just had created. And it says here, the server name is the domain name victimsite.com. And so if I type in victimsite.com in my web browser, the server will interpret that as go look in this folder here and serve the index file or whatever extension they put on it. And then the second one here is another one for hacker site. And so a different folder and a different URL, the domain name will uh, resolve to localhost. Okay, so when you got that set up, you can save the changes. Now let's go see what I actually published. So let's go look in the victim folder. So you can see that this uh, web server is running a page called victim, uh, site CSS, and index. Let's go ahead and open this with VS Code and see what it looks like. So I'm editing the files in VS Code. You can see index, site, and victim. So victim HTML is simply a message that says you're looking at the victim site. So let's test that out. So let's go to the victim site, and uh, I'm going to put in here uh, slash victim HTML. And sure enough, it displays the message hello from the victim site. So let's take a look at the hacker site. You can see that we have hacker HTML here, and it says this is the hacker site. So if we looked at the source code, you wouldn't be surprised to see what it is. So here is the source code for this website. It's hacker HTML, and it says this is the hacker site. We have this keylog we're going to make in a minute, and then finally this keylog text. All right, so let's do a stop and check to make sure that you're uh, on the right page here. Uh, first of all, did you get your IP address for uh, 127001 resolved for these two different host names. Did you edit the file in your MAMP server so that it will actually redirect traffic to a certain folder? Did you create a file that you can view on a website? And if you have, you should be able to see these two messages. 
So if you've gotten this far, you may have learned a lot already, even before you started to do the hacking. All right, so let's get to the code now. So let's bring up the uh, the uh, victims website and see what I created. So the victim PHP website looks like this. We have a uh, message and a form. So take a look there and you can just copy what you see. So the action says we are going to call ourself. So it'll post to itself. You can see that the method is post. And we have an input called comment title and another one called comment text. And uh, well, then we have a submit button. So this part of the code is to display the form. Now, if there is a submit to this form, we're going to have the second section come into play that says post title. If post title has been sent to this page, then we know we're going to display messages. If not, we'll stop, we'll die, and we will post nothing. Then when we get to the last section, we are going to have an area called post area, and we are going to do a print R. So print R is a formatted way to show a variable like an array and all of its components. So that's a nice PHP troubleshooting command if you haven't seen that before. And so in this section, we're going to take whatever was posted to us, the title will be displayed and the text. So you notice there's no sanitation going on. There's no cleaning up of what the text is. There's no checking for any kind of danger. We just accept the post from the uh, user as a baby would take candy from a stranger. And so that's where we're going to get into trouble is when we repost the comments, they are not filtered for any uh, JavaScript. Okay, so that's the uh, victim site. And I put some CSS in here. If you'd like to dress it up, you can see I've got uh, using some colors and a few different sizes. So you can do it without CSS, but you can copy this stuff here if it would make your site look better. Okay, so let's check that out. Let's go test it. So instead of going to victim uh, HTML, I'm going to type in index PHP, and you should be able to comment something. Let's put in ASDF and post. And sure enough, we get the post message with print R. And then below, we get the text for the title and the body. So it's working as a standalone website. And now we're going to move on to the hacker website. So let's bring up the hacker page and its source of content. So the first, first file that you made was hacker.html. Now the keylog page. Let's take a look at that one. So keylog PHP is the listener application. This one doesn't actually display anything on the website. Instead, it saves items to the text file. So the first line is interesting. It says header and it says access control allow origin and the word star. So what is that? That means that this script will accept a posted message from any domain on the internet. Normally that's a horrible idea because you're worried about people cross posting and you don't want that to happen. Well, in this case, we're trying to make it happen because we are the hacker. And so this script will listen to any domain name. Then it says, uh, let's check to see if what, what was sent to us is uh, was a post with a key called key. So that's uh, an associative array. If it is, if it is existing, if, it, if it's there, then we're going to open up key log text and uh, a plus means append plus. So we're going to keep adding to it. We're not going to overwrite it. And then we're going to do an F write and send this keystroke to the log file and close it. And so that's the whole program. It'll just listen for keystrokes from another website from anywhere on the internet. Okay, so I've got the log file. I'm just going to delete that because um, I don't want to see uh, anything yet. So the log file is gone. Now let's go over here and paste in this fancy JavaScript. I'm going to type another test here. I'm going to say let's talk. And then let's paste in the code and look at what this is. So let's uh, zoom in for a second here. So it's going to say we're going to call a key press function. So anytime that this web script is running, it will trigger an event when a key is pressed. So that means the next person that comes along is going to have their keystroke stolen. 
So the function is going to have an event variable. So this next line here says event equals event or Windows event. So this is kind of old code. It comes back from when Internet Explorer was used on the Internet. I don't think that's true anymore, but it's still there. So we're going to say take the event in the char code that was sent with it, and we are going to turn it into a string and save it as the variable called key. So now, if there is a keystroke, we're going to start at this curly bracket and go on. If there's no keystroke, then do nothing. So we're going to URI encode it, and then we're going to call the fetch command. So fetch is usually sent to get data from somewhere, but fetch can also be used to put data. And so in this case, we're putting it. So we're going to fetch, we're going to call a remote site. And so I've hard coded the values hackersite.com as keylog PHP and telling it we're going to post this message. So the header for this post will say it's going to be a, a URL encoded message and the body will say key equals parameter. So this parameter variable was defined up here as an encoded value of key. So it simply listens for keystrokes and if there are any, it sends off a fetch command to the key log PHP. So remember, that's running on a different URL. Okay, so we got this whole thing set up and it should work again just like we did before. So now I'm gonna type in a message. So I type in, I'm getting hacked and I don't know it. And you can see over here on the right side that the uh, victim is being uh, spied on. And let's check to see if this code is running. So I'm going to do an inspect on this side of the page. And let's go find the comments section down here at the bottom and let's see if there's anything that looks like scripting yeah so there we go so the JavaScript is running here so if I were to post a new comment and go find that JavaScript I think it'll be gone yeah so now the new comment area has just text in it so in this case the hack only works one time if you were to persist this as a comment stored in a database then it would be showing up time and time again on the victim's website. If you'd like to learn more about cybersecurity and good programming techniques, uh, check out my website. I have a whole bunch of courses on studycoding.org, or you can just look at my YouTube channel and you'll see them there. On the website, I provide you some source code. So if you don't want to type any of this junk and you just want to get the package and download it, uh, you can get it there. If this was good enough for you, uh, subscribe, please. And like the video it really helps out on the youtube algorithm and it makes my website a little bit more popular than it was before thanks for watching